What's up guys, Charlie here. Welcome back to Conquering Kerbal Space Program. This is episode 60. And this was originally going to be one of those, um, what do you call it, in the moment, real time commentary type episodes in real time. Um, but you see, the thing is, after I got done doing it, and I realized that I also had to do post commentary at the end of it because people walked into the house, I realized that the episode was gonna be 10 minutes long, like 12 minutes long. So rather than do that, I've decided to speed this entire episode up and just talk you through pretty much the basics of what I'm doing here, which is way easier than um, kind of making you go through all this stuff. And, th and in that sense, I'm actually going to combine, or I'm actually gonna combine this episode with the next one. So when you start to hear me speak in real time this time, you're going to hear me uh, kind of say, you know, hey, welcome back. And, you know, because I, I recorded it with the idea that it would be a separate episode. So basically what I'm doing in this one right now is we're launching the moon station. Uh, I've also got contracts to take pictures of Kerbin, which is what I'm doing with the camera on top. And um, I also have contracts to, I mean, I've got contracts to do a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm going to try and to try to get as many of them done as possible. Launch the moon station. I need to crash into the top of the moon with this little tiny probe here um, and basically crash into it so that the little flashometer thingy that's orbiting the moon can see it and record the, the spectrum of light, if you will. And so I'm detaching it now. I'm being smarter. I'm going to wait until I'm in the moon's sphere of influence before I detach it and try to make a maneuver with it. That way I don't run out of battery power with that little probe. This is the exact same launch. It is identical to the Minmus station in every way. I basically just took the Minmus launch uh, save file or the craft file and renamed it to moon station really quick and then launched it. That's all I did. So I'm getting myself above a 50 degree inclination when I make the impact and I'm gonna time it right to where the flashometer is above the horizon when I crash. In the upper right hand corner, you'll see the confirmation that it worked, awesome. And then I go to the flashometer and transmit the science and complete the contract. Very, very cool. The other contracts I have are essentially just random science stuff. And unfortunately, even though I have Kerbin Random Science, my satellite's called Random Science, um, I have one around Kerbin, but I don't have one around Minmus. And I have one around the moon too, but it's kind of outdated. It doesn't have the latest experiments on it, so I probably will have to do another one. Um, but regardless, the contract is to do it around Minmus. So I have to send this satellite out to Minmus. So once I get that maneuver settled and I get that maneuver you know, kind of in, in there to where I burn and I get out to Minmus. I'm then gonna come back to my uh, station at the moon, and I'm gonna make sure that the moon station is in the orbit that it is supposed to be in. And the orbit that it's supposed to be in is under 60 kilometers uh, all around, so that's pretty easy. Once I get that orbit the way I want it, I'm gonna tip it up and make sure that it points normal and points up just like the other stations do. And then I'm pretty much just gonna leave that alone. But I have to go back to Minimus now and make sure that the random science satellite is going to be captured, obviously. It has to be the active vessel in order to perform the maneuver. So I'm gonna be out at Minimus now. And once I get out to Minmus, I, re I, I definitely over-engineered this little satellite dish. I'm not even going to need to detach the giant tank that's attached to it. So there's so much Delta V left in this thing. Um, I'm probably going to send it to Eve or something when this is all over with because there's just so much Delta V left in it. Um, but you'll notice the pink line that's orbiting around Minmus. That is where I need this satellite to be. Not only do I have a perform science uh, contract around Minmus, but I also have a launch a satellite into designated orbit type contract as well. So I'm going to get this satellite to match the orbit around the pink line. But once it matches the pink line, I'm going to immediately move it. I, I don't know who paid me to uh, move the Minmus satellite there, or I don't know who, who paid me to launch that satellite, but I hope they're not upset that I'm moving it right away because I need to get the periapsis to be in low Minmus orbit and the apoapsis in high Minmus orbit. I need to have a good amount of eccentricity. I need to have um, a certain degree of inclination, and then I need to perform the experiments just like we've done before. We've done, the, we've done this kind of contract before, and it's going to happen over and over and over again because that's the kind of contracts this is. Probably going to have to do it around every single body maybe even multiple times. Um, but that's the whole point. Launch the science satellite so that when it happens again, when it asks me to do it again, I already have a satellite out there in position with fuel that I can just move really quick and do it. And I don't have to launch anything else out there. It's free money. It's very, very cool that way. Um, so I'm going to get that in there. I'm going to do it. 
And that's pretty much it. Though That satellite has to wait for 94 days, and pretty much a lot of our contracts are going to require us to wait. But some of them are good to go, as I will mention in the next video, which is actually this video. So thank you for listening to me ramble. I just covered like 15 minutes of videos worth in like less than six. I hope that makes some people happy. It's really not all that interesting of stuff to do. I am going to kind of do these contracts off camera more often. But now I have something really cool to share with you. If you watch this far, you won't be disappointed. Haha. <laughs> hey you guys, Charlie here. Welcome back to Conquering Kerbal Space Program. Uh, most of the contracts that I have right now, I've been doing a bunch, you guys saw the last video. Um, uh, most of these contracts require me to wait. Like, you know, 45 days I have to have this in orbit here, 94 days this has to be in orbit, and then once that's done, I actually have been told I have to move this satellite. Uh, so I'll move it as soon as this is done doing its thing. Uh, but I do have some contracts that I can do uh, without, um, you know, without waiting. Like I can recover uh, this module from orbit of Kerbin. That's this module right here. It's like this question mark. Based on the specifications of this, though, um, doesn't seem like it's too hard. 0. 0.6 tons, you know, 0. 0.25 or two, two and a half meter meter uh, width and length. So it doesn't seem that big of a deal. We also have a contract to send crew to the moon station, which I don't really want crew on the moon station, at least not yet anyway, if I'm gonna do it at all. So I'll probably just go up there, dock with it, get the contract fulfilled and then bring them back. Um, and then launch the sun space station. <laughs> now this one is a station that goes into solar orbit um, and it has the same criteria as the rest of the stations, except this one will pay us 1.87 million, or pretty much 1.87 million. Uh, so a lot of money to be had for that. We're definitely going to do that. But today, I'm going to introduce you to something that I've been working on for about six or seven hours of play. And it is called the PII Scimitar. Hello, say hello to the Scimitar. Oh yeah, this is our first space plane. And it is a beauty. Uh, this is our primary cargo plane. It's going to be used to send cargo and used to send modules to the uh, to the space station. And this is the Mark IV space plane system used in conjunction with KW rocketry for the engines, for the for the rocket engines, and B9 aerospace for some of the wing parts. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's and everything else I think is stock from there. Um, this engine is these two engines, the Valkyrie engines. Uh, let's like, speaking of engines, let's go ahead and start them up crank up the throttle let's hit the gas um, these engines here are uh, I think from the mark 4 sp space plane system I think so um, I, I think you'll get these if you've got the mark 4, mark 4 which honestly the mark 4 is awesome so you totally should do it uh, let's disengage the brakes let this thing get up now that it's kind of up to uh, full thrust it takes a bit to get this thing up to full power get these engines up to full power but um, there's a lot of air intakes all over the place on this thing, helping those out. Lots of air intakes. We've got intakes up there. We've got a bunch down below. I probably have too many, but I want these jet engines to last us as long as possible, getting us up, in, uh, up into orbit. And when I, sh when I tell you, I'm not going to show you just yet what we're bringing today, but this plane, okay, this plane uh, doesn't take off very fast. <laughs> you can see it doesn't take off very fast at all. Uh, but when I get to about here, I usually kick on kick on the rockets and uh, get it up to speed so that it can take off. But once it gets up to speed, this thing takes off nice and easily. It takes off at about 140 to 150 meters per second. Uh, yeah, a little bit faster than that, I guess. So you do need to get it up to go fast to get it up in the air because it is pretty heavy. But once you get it up the speed you're good to go that's what the rockets are there for to kind of help you get up to speed just a little bit faster and uh, then they can be disengaged just as fast as they were engaged and you can basically be dependent on the jet engine from there uh, we're gonna keep our nose tipped up at about 20 degrees if I can get it up there probably should have had the rockets on just a tad bit longer in fact, I'm going to kind of kick them on just a little bit longer. I want to get up to speed a little bit here. There we go. Okay, that's good. So we'll keep ourselves pointed at about 20 degrees if we can, if I can get it to stay. 
Um, this plane is capable, right? I, I've tested it out pretty extensively and there's been, I mean, I, I would have walked you guys through the build process and recorded that, but honestly, you would have been having like six hours of video. And I, I just didn't want to time accelerate through six hours of video and then walk you through things like that. I, I don't know. Maybe if you guys want me to rebuild it um, from scratch, uh, I can rebuild it maybe um, to show you guys what I did. But honestly, I mean, if you guys just look at the parts, you can kind of see how it's built. Um, I am considering, if anyone is interested, and I imagine you probably are, um, I don't know, some people are probably. Um, if you're interested in the craft file, let me know down in the comments down below. I, like, I can upload it kind of like I did the, uh, the Frankenplain. The problem is though, the, the main issue why I don't want to do it just yet is that these are not the finalized engines. I, I just don't have good engines for SSTOs yet. I don't have like say the rapiers, I don't have access to sabers and things like that. So I'm kind of, this is sort of a makeshift plan to make as much as I can do or like to make available as much as I can make available. So you know, do the best you can basically is what this is. Um, I am going to disable access to these tanks up here and to this tank here and here. Uh, and the reason for that is because the way this is balanced, the center of mass for the plane on takeoff is right in front of the center of lift. It is it's, it's right in front of it. Um, so it's the most stable airplane like ever. <laughs> um, it's not very maneuverable, but it doesn't need to be. Its only task really is to take off from the runway and just head in a straight line up, uh, or just head in a sh head straight and go up. It doesn't need to turn or anything like that. So uh, we're just going to stay right on the 90 degree line. We're just going to head straight east from the from the station from the takeoff, and uh, doesn't need to be maneuverable. Uh, but if you allow fuel to drain from this engine on ascent as you move your way up, if you allow fuel to drain from this, these two tanks and these front tanks here, um, you're going to have your center of mass dip back. And it's gonna dip, ma dip back too far to the point where it becomes behind the center of lift. And then uh, I challenge you to keep this nose down at that point. You just, no matter how hard you push, you can't keep the nose down, it's gonna flip up. Um, so uh, you'll end up upside down pretty quick, uh, spinning out of control. So disable disable the fuel flow from here, from here. I don't maybe this, maybe this one isn't necessary, but like this one for sure is. Uh, from here and from here, basically everything above this line needs to have it all the access disabled for it. Um, and then I also take this one out too because there's a lot of fuel in there. Uh, so basically, this engine is going to uh, yeah, we're just going to head up. The goal here is to get to about 18 to 19 K. Uh, and then we're going to tip our nose back up and really fire these rockets and get ourselves up into orbit. Um, hopefully our Apple apps is about 21 K when that happens. That's the goal. 21 K Apple apps and about 1100 meters per second travel speed. Uh, that's not surface speed. That's orbital speed. So our surface speed will probably only be about 700 and maybe 700 meters per second, 800 meters per second, maybe, but orbital velocity is what's more important there. Give you a tour of some of the components here. Um, obviously, this section here from here, 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 and here, these are all cargo bays, but the cargo bays for the Mark, Por Mark IV space plane system actually have these little sort of, I don't know what they exactly they call them, but I'm gonna call them just like, I guess, bumps, <laughs> I don't know, side tanks. They're fuel tanks basically built into the side of the cargo bay, so you can hold fuel in there, which is kind of nice. Um, and of course, there you can switch the fuel type. You can make it liquid fuel or, or, or liquid fuel oxidizer or monopropellant. Um, so you have some flexibility there as well. I'm using B9 wing parts. I think these are B9. I'm pretty sure they are. Uh, for the stabilizers on the front and for pretty much all the wings. Um, I added these at the last minute. I don't know. They're just for looks. I don't even know if they look that good, but yeah, whatever. Um, then we've got, again, I don't know what parts pack it is. I want to say it's still B9, these tail fins here. Uh, I was going to put the ones that have my flag on them, but they're just a little bit too big. They're just, meh. I kind of passed on that. They, I don't know about too big. They just didn't look right, and, and I don't know. I kind of like these ones better, so I went with it. 
course, we've got RCS thrusters all along the sides here that are kind of kind of centered around the center of mass, so they are going to help us maneuver a little bit. Uh, I was going to put thrusters up here to help with like really attitude control at like up here at the nose, but uh, it didn't really work out with the stabilizers and it didn't look good and I kind of went against that. We've got a bunch of air intakes all throughout here, keeping us uh, keeping adequate airflow to these jet engines as far as possible, as high as possible. You can see that the thrust on these jet engines, if I go like this, you see the thrust is starting to decrease, um, which is not particularly a good thing. And if I nose down just a tad, we might be able to counteract that a little bit with a little bit more speed. You can see my surface speed is pretty good here, 725 meters per second surface speed. That translates to um, 908 meters per second orbital velocity, which is pretty good. Uh, I need to get over 1,000 before I consider going up to orbit, though, which is okay because uh, we're actually still climbing. Apoapsis is about 18.6K. And when the apoapsis gets to 20 to 21K, um, that's when I'm going to basically nose up and get this party started. Hopefully our orbital speed is up to 1,000 by then. And then I, the, I added these tanks on the side here to help with the rockets, as well as a place to mount the rockets. Um, I'm not sure what parts these are from. It says MK2A 800X aviation fuel tank. I want to say that these are also B9 parts, but it could be stock. Um, not, not sure. Uh, when you get as many parts packs as I do installed in your game, it's sometimes difficult to figure out what parts are stock and what parts are from a mod, because you start to assume that pretty much every part you're using is a modded part at that point. But um, This space plane cockpit holds four Kerbals, as well as providing food and oxygen and all that stuff reserves. Uh, capable of sustaining a full crew for about two and a half days. These guys will, are, will survive for about five days. There's only two people in here. We've got Jebediah and Bill Kerman in the cockpit of this vessel, which is great. Our Apple apps is over 20K. We are actually over K right now, over 20K right now. And we're actually not able to climb very fast. So I'm gonna go ahead and engage the, I'm gonna go ahead and engage the rockets. And we're gonna tip ourselves up to now about you know, 30 degrees or so. And push ourselves up to orbit. And our jet engines are about to quit. Gets down to about 100 kilometers of thrust. I'm going to go ahead and close all the air intakes. Uh, and I've got this all hot keyed, so you don't have to, like, I don't have to click through them all. So these are all closed now. All the air intakes are closed. The jet, jet engines are about to quit. And there they go. They're done. We're purely on rocket power now, pushing our way up the KW Rocketry Maverick Vs. Turn Kerbal Engineer on. I do have it installed, I just haven't had it open. Uh, you can see we've got 950 something meters per second of Delta V remaining. Uh, more than enough, I think, to get where we need to be. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the liquid fuel access to these two tanks let it start drawing liquid fuel from those tanks if it wants to. That's going to bump up our Delta V even further. Um, the Delta V restriction in this list is in this list here is almost always liquid fuel. Uh, but the goal is going to be to burn off all of the oxidizer first. So basically the rockets take us as far as the rockets can take us. Um, and at that point, um, as soon as the rockets burn out because there's no more oxidizer to access, uh, we'll be completely on these nuclear engines that are right here with the remainder of the liquid fuel, which will probably be basically all of this and all of this. So plenty of, uh, plenty of fuel, plenty of Delta B to make what we need to have happen happen. And I have brought, uh, and you guys, <laughs> I don't know how good you guys, your guys' space planes are. Um, I would love to see what you guys have come up with. Um, I'm not sure what they are, but this thing can haul 62 tons into not just low carbon orbit but it can it can bring 62 tons to the space station and rendezvous and dock to the space station with 62 tons of cargo um, and still have a little bit of fuel left to get back home uh, not a whole lot in fact I probably would refuel a little bit um, while I'm docked if I wanted to get home with it 
And you know what? With an Apple Apps at about 90k right now, I think I'm going to go ahead and kill this. And you'll notice that even though I've killed the engines, our Apple Apps is still climbing. In a rocket, you'd see this go down, but in a space plane, with your nose tipped up like this, you'd see this go up for a little while because the air is still kind of lifting you at your speed. So, I mean, our speed is decreasing. Our orbital velocity is pretty, you know, it's going down, but it's already so high that it doesn't really matter. Take a look at the map view here. We have our craft here and the space station is there. That's where the PISS initial is. That's where the interstellar space station is. So we're going to be on a good track here. I'm not entirely sure like when to take off relative to where the station is in order to rendezvous with it successfully, like right away. I haven't really done a whole lot with space planes before. This is actually, and maybe you won't believe me just because of how awesome this is. <laughs> but um, this is my first ever successful SSTO. Um, I've never actually gotten the space plane thing down. But um, I, I said to myself, you know what? We're going to do this. We're going to do it right. I'm going to spend some time and really do it really well. And I ended up with this. The Scimitar. <laughs> I think it's pretty sweet. So we have 707 meters per second of delta V remaining. And if I close access to... Well, I guess all these tanks are kind of... Yeah, this is where the fuel is being drawn out now. Uh, we have 521 left to burn, so we're not even going to get to the point where we have to turn these tanks on. Um, and we can let these rockets, uh, we can let these rockets burn until they can't burn anymore. Now, that's pretty much what I intend to do. I intend to ma basically make these these rockets burn all of the oxidizer out of this craft, so that once the oxidizer is gone, we can get that's all that weight is gone from the oxidizer. Then we then we can use the the nuclear engines. And we have plenty of uh, liquid fuel at that point. We're going to have more fuel than usual in this um, in this SSTO here, or at least in this flight. We're going to have more leftover fuel than usual because the payload we have is not 62 tons uh, right now. The payload we have today is this. This is uh, one of several branches of our station, if you will. Well, we're going to start with the Pioneer uh, Pioneer module here, and that is connected to this little, I guess, structural tube that Kerbals can travel through, which goes into this docking node, and this is going to end up being sort of our docking node branch. So I'll, I'll bring up some other branches that basically dock to this and dock to this, and it'll have like a variety of different um, docking nodes on there so that crafts can dock to them. So we can have, like for instance, this space plane, the tip of this space plane right here, this is a docking port so i can open this up and it's an extended out a docking port that extends out and we would be able to dock with this to one of these little nodes that eventually end up end up there but right now we don't have that ability because all of the docking ports on the station currently are the big senior ones so there's no way for this craft to dock to them um, so that's what this is. This is going to end up being a node that will branch out and everything. And then this node is going to end up under the station, but currently because the fuel tank is in the way, I can't put this there. So it's actually going to end up going, um, kind of in another spot for the time being. It'll end up going somewhere else. Uh, then we have, this, this is our space tug. I showed you guys this earlier or I showed you guys this before. This is our space tug and it's going to be capable of moving all sorts of heavy things uh, no matter how big it is this will be able to move it um, and hopefully get it into position um, it's going to be difficult and tricky to do especially for attitude corrections and stuff because the thrusters are kind of only here and so if the big thing it's hauling doesn't have the the thrusters if it doesn't have any thrusters on it um, then it's going to be harder to control it now i put thrusters on this pioneer module here so we'll be able to control this a little easier so anyway, that's what we have bringing up to the station right now. Just now approaching Apoaps. So it should be a pretty circular circular orbit here when we're done. You know what? Good enough. Good enough. So that is that. We are in orbit. Um, pretty circular. And we are under the station, which is good because we'll eventually catch up to it. So... 
I just need a maneuver now that'll get me a good rendezvous. So let me work on that. Uh, it's gonna take place in an hour, so we're gonna have to orbit around for a little while, but really it's very easy. It's 27 meters per second, and we'll end up reaching or we'll end up uh, rendezvousing with the station right over here in the middle of the daytime, which is good. Uh, and it will be 6.4 kilometers. So very cool. I'm pretty happy with that. We're going to eventually get in the dark. And because of the proximity and our speed around orbiting at this time and everything when we rendezvous, we'll probably end up having to dock things. Um, we'll probably end up having to dock everything in the night, unfortunately. But, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. I got to dock to the station and I'm not going to just kind of hang out until it's daytime if I... Yeah, I don't want to have to worry about spending more resources that I don't have to spend. So anyway, we need to just go around Kerbin. But before we get going around Kerbin, I do want to show you something else, which I think is great. So I'm going to turn the kill rotation off. And then I'm going to just kind of get this thing moving in a general direction, kind of like this. Okay. I want to show you guys something. Um, somebody brought this up before. I think it's a great idea. I've installed it. Here's some time acceleration. And notice that during time acceleration, the rotation, the momentum that I had um, at the time is maintained through time acceleration. This is because I have persistent rotation installed. So we have persistent rotation and momentum uh, when we enter time acceleration, which I feel like is pretty cool. Um, I like it. It's a little more realistic that way because I can, you know, I time accelerate. I don't have to worry about it. I can't cheat, for instance, let it let the thing kind of get right to where it's going to be and then hit the time acceleration. And now I, I don't have to spend the energy or the RCS to stop the rotation. I, it's going to be persistent now. But on the downside, any tiny, minute, like even the smallest of movements is going to be continued when you enter time acceleration, which means there's no reason at all to ever face the node until you are really close to your, where your burn is going to happen. Like there's no reason whatsoever for me to even care about this craft being pointed on that node right now because we're 40 minutes away from the burn. And during that 40 minutes, that even the smallest of, of movements that I have is gonna throw me off course anyway. Um, unless of course I'm gonna be in one times time acceleration with SAS and then I can just like actually wait 40 minutes, um, which who's gonna do that? So basically you really have to sort of um, better understand, yeah, you have to, yeah, I, I don't know how else to say it. You wanna wait until you're really close to your node before you get yourself into position. That's pretty much all there is to it there. So anyway, yeah, persistent rotation. That's what that mod is called. I think it's cool. Uh, one of the things that you can do with persistent rotation because of this is you can have your space station always facing a certain direction. You can, you, you can have like, for instance, the front of my space station where I want these docking nodes, I can have them always facing Kerbin. Rather than orbiting around to where sometimes it's, it's away from Kerbin and sometimes it's in front of Kerbin, the whole station can persistently rotate with the planet and keep itself oriented the same direction, which I think is pretty useful. Gives us 570 meters per second, way more fuel than we need. Um, if this doesn't have max load, if you don't put like the full 62 tons in this, um, you know, maybe you put 40 tons or 30 tons in it or something, uh, you can actually use this to take, uh, I can actually use this to take cargo to the moon and also to Minmus as well. Um, there will be enough fuel to do that. For Minmus, uh, what I'll probably end up needing to do is I'll need to, I'll need to dock to the Minmus station and refuel at the station, but I can still bring cargo there. So it's getting itself oriented. I got plenty of time to the maneuver, so I'm just going to let the reaction wheels do all the work. There's no real need for me to spend all the monopropellant yet, so... Uh, we got plenty of monopropellant. It's built into this cockpit, 260 monopropellant built into the cockpit. Very cool. Uh, if I turn the lights on, not, not these lights. Actually, you know what? Like if I turn, this plane needs some lights. That's what I'm missing, you know? I need some lights, like a couple of lights here on the wings and um, I don't really think any underneath is necessary, but maybe. Uh, probably not actually, because this is the lifting body. This, uh, this, 
um, plane has a lifting body. So it, like the body itself serves as a lifting surface. Um, it's not integrated like specifically into uh, Ferrum Aerospace Research, but as you can see, it, it does pretty well for, for, with FAR. As long as you you know build it right, it does pretty well with FAR. And it did take a lot of trial and error to get it be, be built right. It definitely took a long time to get like little tweaking of different wing positions and different types of wing structures and you know how big do I need these things to be and what orientation, what direction do they need to be faced? Do I move them up or lower or, or higher or you know how do I navigate to getting around this air intake? Like all this stuff I had to like move around. And for the people who are wondering, no, I do not have tweak scale installed. There's no tweak scale. So this is uh I, I'm trying to do this whole thing without tweak scale just because I'm not really sure why. To be honest, at, at, at the beginning it was because I didn't want the bugs that were associated with it, but now that those bugs are ironed out, I'm not really sure what I have against tweak scale. I guess there's probably no reason not to have it. Um, but so far anyway, for now, I don't have it. Okay, I'm trying to kill it off to zero, but you're, you're not... Sometimes you just can't get it to zero, but I'm working on it. <laughs> we'll point target prograde and then burn exactly toward the target. Hopefully getting our rendezvous at about 200 meters or so. Um, I can't dock to this, so I am going to be controlling the cargo separately to dock to the station. And I want to kind of give me, I want to give myself a little bit of room so I don't like have to deal with the plane getting too close. Two to three hundred meters parking, uh, uh, parked two to three hundred meters is probably pretty good. So, okay, so we're facing that. Let's just go ahead and burn this. Don't want to go too fast because every bit you burn, you have to burn back. So that's actually probably pretty good. So let's go ahead and get relative velocity retrograde. We've got two minutes and 50 seconds until we have to, uh, to burn. So I got some time to maneuver. We can save the retro, we can save the RCS if we need to. Um, this is kind of strange. I don't know if this is just a characteristic of it being a plane or if it's got something to do with persistent rotation. It probably is persistent rotation, but the, the uh, reaction wheels getting us there, and even the RCS fuel sometimes, it's, it's got this rotation, this extra rotation as it moves that it doesn't need to do, but it does anyway. Um, so I'm thinking that might have something to do with it. I don't know. I don't know. Use the time acceleration to get it kind of closer to where it needs to be. And you can see using the RCS, I'm actually burning certain directions and I end up actually getting further away from the target because of that momentum. So the R this is why I like to use the reaction wheels a lot because if I'm using the RCS, it's, it's also adjusting my trajectory to where the reaction wheels is just, just adjusting where I'm facing. The RCS actually pushes me around in, in space. So now instead of being 0.2, I'm going to be 0.3 away. But again, I'm not really worried about a couple hundred meters. I actually kind of prefer a couple hundred meters of separation. So I'm all right with it. So we're getting ourselves lined up for a very small burn. Actually, let's actually switch this up. We'll disengage the rockets and we'll do this with the nukes because I want some a little bit more precision here, I think. All right. So 106 seconds. 
another thing you noticed that you just saw this skip probably or maybe you saw this skip that's not a skip in the video that actually skipped like that um when i go to time acceleration with persistent rotation um if i haven't done it in a while this persistent like after i've installed persistent rotation my time acceleration actually jolts things i'm not i'm not sure about that every all the numbers like that right there see that like i don't know why it does that it's really bizarre but it's like, I don't know what to believe, you know? It's really strange. So, anyway. Now I'm going to be 0.4 kilometers away. And I didn't do anything, you know? Very strange. So when you get close, if you have persistent rotation active, and I might actually delete this because of that bug. It's really annoying. It's got to be a bug, because it's like... The station was here and I was headed towards it and now it's over there and I'm actually going to be further away from it in my target. So I, I don't know. I, I think maybe I'll delete this until something like about that is worked out, but uh, I thought I'd give it a try. This is the first time I've played with persistent rotation. Um, I haven't been doing any of my practice, any of my practice flights with it. So this is the first time I've actually done anything at all with this active. Not, uh, yeah, kind of a pain in the butt. Okay, we're back at the scimitar, and we're pretty much parked, about 265. We're moving a little bit far farther away from the station, but that's okay. I'd rather it be moving a little bit away than moving towards it. So, let's go ahead and open up the cargo bay. And we have flight computer telling the whole vessel to kill rotation, and that's what I want right now. I'm going to activate RCS to make sure that it has uh, authority on that. And then I'm going to say... Um, I'm going to say decouple this node. So we're going to decouple this. And then I'm going to switch to controlling. Um, what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why are you bouncing around? Uh, can I? There we go. Okay. I want to control from here. And then uh, I want to figure out what direction I have to burn to get out of here, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, so it's going to be pretty much this way, and then I want to nose up. So let's nose this up. Yep, pick it up. There we go. And then forward thrust. Okay, there we go. And we are out of the cargo bay. Woohoo! Now we have to get over there. Um, and I think that docking port is what I want my target to be. Now, one thing I do want to do is I want to make sure it's oriented the right way. So remember the notches. We had the notches. We needed to have the notches be the right way. This is how I want it oriented, I think. And I wish the docking ports would require this in order to dock. They don't. So if I dock a little bit crooked, then the whole station will end up being crooked, and that's that's no good. So we will like it just it just wants to rot it just wants to rotate me. I don't understand that. It just flat out wants me like this, even though I don't want to be like that. Very odd. Things looking good. Approaching. Approaching. Let's kill the velocity a bit. And. Turn off SAS. Turn off RCS. Doc. Come on, dock it. Right there. Come on, you're right there. Come on! What is going on with this? Get in there. Yeah! There we go. We are docked and oriented the right way, and everything is looking good. So we've added one, one of our many, many modules to go. 
has been added to the station. Now this, this here, this node, this docking node is actually going to be here. Um, and what I could do is I could break all this stuff down for material kits now and then get this started. I probably should do that. The problem with that though, is that then I have to forfeit like my, my solar panels. I won't have any solar panels then. Now I could uh, activate the solar panels on these. Like if I extend these solar panels, cannot deploy while stowed. Oh, go figure, <laughs> go figure. Well, okay. We will at least turn the lights on everywhere. So all lights will be on now. Everything's looking good. And uh, this, this node will actually end up being down here attached to this. Uh, and as will this, this uh, tug will also be down there. But for now, it's, uh, it's not gonna happen because for now it's, uh, well, it's, just, it's just not. I could move this, it's a little bit, see the thing is like I don't really care. <laughs> I'm just thinking of like what I want to do for the future. I'm going to have habitation. We're going to have, uh, I probably should do the science stuff next. Yeah, let's do the science stuff next for sure. So I'll leave this just like this, the way it is. No big deal. And so here we are back at the, uh, the scimitar. We can close up our yep we can close up our cargo bay and let's get ourselves uh, prepared for re-entry so I need a I need a maneuver node that's going to get me entering Kerbal's Kerbin's atmosphere a little bit before the KSC and then I can just fly to the KSC so I think that's how it works again I've never done an SCSTO before so I'm really not sure how this actually works um, but the way I see it is as long as I kind of get into the atmosphere at relatively the right point, I can fly to the KSC and land. I mean, I, that makes sense to me. Uh, one thing we could try to do, I don't have the tug anymore though. I don't really think I should bring the tug back with me either. But I could check out and see what this is, this module here. If I set that as the target, I wonder if I can get a rendezvous with that. Let's see. Yeah, okay, I'm back with some more post commentary. Sorry, I have uh, kind of a noisy house. Um, so I, we are gonna rendezvous with this uh, random module that I'm supposed to retrieve from orbit. Uh, the, the description of the module in the contract does say that it's a two and a half meter uh, part, or at least it's two and a half meter width and length. Um, so that tells me that I can fit it inside the Mark IV cargo bay because the entire point of the Mark IV space plane system is to haul two and a half meter parts into orbit. So I, but I have no idea what it is. So I, I'd like, you know, let's go go rendezvous with it and uh, check out and see what it is. So I bring out uh, Bill Kerman here to go and kind of get over, get on over over to it. And I noticed that it's a very interesting looking like fuel tank. And I, I've never seen this part before. And I'm kind of looking at it going, what in the world? Like, where is this in my parts list? Have I unlocked this yet? Do I have to recover something that I haven't yet unlocked? And what can I put in it? What kind of fuels does it hold? I don't know. So I'm going to go and investigate that later. Uh, I know now, as of this recording, I know now, but I didn't know at the time. So I'm going to have to go and investigate that. And I'm also going to probably need some sort of a mini tug or something to get it into my... Uh, into my plane later as well to uh, recover it. So now starts the probably the most terrifying part of my playthrough so far. Um, my re-entry with an SSTO and I have, like I said, I've never done this before with an SSTO. Uh, I've seen it done on YouTube a couple of times so I think I know what I'm doing but I really don't. And I encounter my first real problem and that is electric charge. Because I have this drone core uh, on, the, on the vessel, uh, having SAS on is actually pretty taxing to my battery. And because I'm entering at nighttime, which was really stupid, uh, I have actually no way of generating electric charge, um, even like when I'm just outside the atmosphere. Uh, so note to self, try and time it to where you get in, in the middle of the daytime. The second thing I'm not sure of is what angle my nose is supposed to be at on re-entry. Now right here I'm trying 30 degrees, I feel like maybe that's okay, but 
I'm really not sure what it is. And you can see I've got some heating problems. But what you're not seeing here is me cursing under my breath, trying to figure out how in the world to control this plane. Because without SAS on, it doesn't do what I want it to do. And frankly, it doesn't really do what I want it to do anyway. I'm also losing a lot of electric charge. I keep putting reserve power into the battery, hoping to keep it alive a little bit longer, but honestly, I'm really kind of worried about it. And then the plane just starts to drift to the left and I finally lose complete control of this. So then I say, you know what? I'm gonna have absolutely no control at all if I lose power. So I'm just gonna boot up these nuclear, ba these nuclear engines. They have alternators in them, so as long as they're burning fuel, I'm gonna be generating electric charge. And that's pretty much what I've been doing this whole time, is I'm plummeting towards Kerbin, not at all like you're supposed to and parts of my plane are blowing up and overheating and my plane, my, my wings are getting ripped apart. And the only thing I'm thinking of is, oh my God, this, my first SSTO mission, uh, I'm going to lose Jebediah and Bill. Like these guys are gonna die. That's the only thing I kept thinking of. And well, pretty much the whole plane blew up, but I finally got into the atmosphere and slow enough to where the heat stops and we drift down and down and down and thankfully I packed parachutes on this thing you guys saw that I packed the big parachutes on here over the center of mass or at least what used to be the center of mass which probably is not the center of mass anymore because I've lost some of my mass uh, so I had really no idea what I was going to do for landing I was hoping that these parachutes would slow me down enough to where I would land safely but I did manage to get into the atmosphere, at least, with most of my plane intact. I lost um, most of my wings, almost all my wings. I lost one side of my stabilizers, and I lost uh, both of my jet engines and one of my uh, nuclear engines. So overall, I recover most of my vessel here um, with the parachutes open, but my gosh, was that stressful. Uh, and I am going to let myself in the moment finish this video. So here you go. Oh my gosh, that is so stressful. Oh my god, that is so like so stressful, you guys. Uh, well, it's a single stage to orbit. It does work, but we're not going to recover the wings. Um, uh, well, we've got a couple of wings here that did survive. That so, so wow, just wow. Um, yeah, we've got one stabilizer, which is probably why we don't have any stability. Uh, we have one nuclear engine left. Both rockets survived, but of course there's no um, there's no uh, oxidizer to burn with them anyway. But we did manage to come down and survive. And I think I think in case of this thing coming apart in the future, I'm gonna put some parachutes along the sides of this cabin here too. Um, just so that if, we, if something bad does happen and this thing breaks apart, then uh, I can do something about that. I also need to figure out my weight distribution for re-entry because I think, I'm, I think my center of mass is too far back. Um, I, I started to flip up. My nose started to flip up and I lost complete control. I couldn't do anything. And I'm pretty sure it's, it's, I'm going to say it's probably a center of mass, um, center of mass problem. I don't know that, but I'm gonna guess that it is. As far as the crew though, they are alive, although Bill rightfully is a little shook up. Jeb had fun. <laughs> and power management was a big deal too. You probably saw during the time lapse, uh, because I'm definitely gonna time lapse that. You probably saw during the time lapse that I was burning my engines. Whoa. Well, we're not balanced there but at least we're going like five meters per second. There's that. I do have enough parachutes on there anyway. Uh, we're going slow enough though to where I think landing is gonna be nice and easy, hopefully, so we will see. I'm gonna time accelerate a little bit here. Get us down. That's really stressful, guys. I thought I was gonna lose Jeb and Bill. I might do this unmanned next time, just, just because, I mean, um, we're, I'm gonna need to add more batteries for sure. We're gonna need, I'm gonna need like a couple of thousand more extra charge because um, managing the power with this and, and you know, working with Ampere, I'm just like, wow, I'm losing power because uh, SAS, when you have a probe core, it is 
as uh, advanced as mine is, as advanced as this one is. Please don't blow up. 4.5 meters per second. Yes. Okay, this might explode though. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, I really wish those parachutes wouldn't have let me down like that, but all right. We did lose something else. Uh, what was it? I don't know what else it was. Maybe it was one of these, uh, maybe it was one of these air things. But uh, mission success, yeah. Crew report, no, can't get any science out of it. Thought we might be able to get some science, so. Actually, I can take a soil sample from here, can't I? I won't be able to get back in the plane though. This plane is not designed to have people leave on the ground, so. Okay, well, let's recover the vessel, wow. Okay, so we got no science for that. Uh, we managed to recover 78% of the cost of the, of the parts that we had. So we got 110,000 funds back, which is pretty good because that means we've kind of lost, I think this plane costs about 231 when it's full of fuel sitting on the, on the launch pad without anything in the cargo bay. So, uh, and I have to believe like maybe 30 or 40 K of that is fuel, right? So we, we lost about 90 K in that transaction, which is better than losing, better than losing Kerbals. We, we managed to recover more than half of the funds, and so that's good. Despite the distance we had to travel, so that's pretty good. Oh, okay, well, we have one station module up. The next uh, station module I'm gonna put up is, or the next parts of the station I'm gonna put up actually does require, uh, well, is the SSTO will be useful there, so I'm gonna need to rethink how that thing flies. Uh, the flying part's easy, the getting to orbit part's easy. Um, it's the coming back part that is difficult. So I'm gonna figure that out. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching. I hope this video wasn't didn't end up being too long. Uh, if you like the video, give me a thumbs up. If you like the plane, give me a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe if you're not already, so you know when uh, new videos are available, if you think I deserve it. And um, I'll try to earn it next time if I didn't. So. Thanks for watching. Bye.